Item number, SCP-004. Object class, Euclid. Special containment procedures. When handling items SCP-004-2 through SCP-004-13, proper procedure is vital. The items are not permitted to be moved off-site unless accompanied by two Level 4 security personnel. Under no circumstances should any other component of SCP-004 be taken through SCP-004-1. The effects of doing so are as yet unknown, and the current cost of experimentation makes further research impractical. Should any of the objects contained within SCP-004-1 breach containment, or the facility be breached, the keys must be brought inside and the door closed prior to activation of Site-62's on-site warhead. Unauthorized removal of keys from the testing area is grounds for immediate termination. Level 1 clearance is required for basic access to SCP-004-1. Level 4 clearance is required for use of SCP-004-2-13. Description: SCP-004 consists of an old wooden barn door, SCP-004-1, and a set of 12 rusted steel keys, SCP-004-2 through SCP-004-13. The door itself is the entrance to an abandoned factory and data expunged. Chronological history. July 2nd, 1949. A group of three juveniles trespassing on federal property near find the door. According to their testimony, they found a set of rusted keys in an iron lockbox and determined what door the keys unlock. The juveniles are taken into custody after they contact Sheriff when one of their friends, SCP-004-CAS-01, goes missing. July 3rd, 1949. Local authorities find the severed right hand of SCP-004-CAS-01, 8 kilometers from SCP-004-1. Other parts of SCP-004-CAS-01's body are found scattered as far as 32 kilometers from the factory. Under interrogation, the apprehended juveniles tell authorities that upon opening the door with one of the keys, SCP-004-CAS-01 was torn into several pieces each of which disappeared. At this point, the SCP Foundation takes over the investigation. July 4th, 1949. SCP Agent <laughs> obtains the keys from the local authorities to begin testing. Tests show that SCP-004-2 through SCP-004-13 all fit into a single lock on the large barred door. Twelve Class D personnel are assigned to test the effects of the door. Of the 12 test subjects each trying a different key to enter the room, only two survive. Opening the door with any key except SCP-004-7 or SCP-004-12 caused the test subjects to be torn apart in multiple directions. However, no dismembered parts were found until later. At the time of writing, only two parts of each subject have been recovered, with the exception of the subject using SCP-004-1 whose pieces were scattered in close proximity. The others have, for all intents and purposes, vanished from existence. Of the two surviving subjects, only one, having used SCP-004-7, returned unharmed. The other came back in a near catatonic state, able only to remove himself from the room and then collapse on the floor, and had to be restrained to prevent him from gouging out his eyes. The subject using SCP-004-7 said that he had entered a large room, impossibly big for the size of the attached building. After his exit, SCP-004-1 was propped open, and an armed squad of Level 3 personnel entered. The size of the room is impossible to measure, and the doorframe and the individuals in the room are the only part of the room that can be felt or illuminated. July 16, 1949. The juvenile suspects and sheriff are terminated. August 2nd, 1949. It is declared a hazardous area due to unexploded ordnance and fences erected in order to prevent civilian ingress. Tests to determine safety of exposure to environment behind SCP-004-1 begin. December 1st, 1950. Space-time anomalies resulting from exposure to SCP-004 are confirmed. Testing is suspended until further notice. July 2nd, 19...
The unaccounted for remains of SCP-004-CAS-01 appear unexpectedly outside SCP-004-1. Despite being killed decades before, the remains of SCP-004-CAS-01 are not decomposed in any manner and are still warm to the touch. Blood remains uncoagulated. The remains are remanded for testing. July 4th, 19... The unaccounted for remains of one of the 12 original test subjects appear in similar manner to those of SCP-004-CAS-01. The remains have been designated SCP-004-CAS-02. Records suggest that both SCP-004-CAS-01 and CAS-02 used SCP-004-1. March 21st, 1999 With the massive proliferation of nuclear weapons, and World War III only years away, construction has begun on a site inside SCP-004-1. The site is to stock supplies for person days. April 21st, 1999 has ordered the site inside SCP-004-1 to be expanded to include emergency storage for all mobile SCP specimens and a petabyte database for the storage of all SCP data. The facility is now referred to as Site-62. September 25th, 2000 Site-62 is operational. Labs and containment units are complete and can contain the most dangerous specimens. Backup of the SCP database has begun. January 25th, 2001 Due to time anomalies, see space-time anomalies below, all personnel working at Site-62 are now required to reside on site permanently. Families of personnel are to be informed that loved ones perished in an industrial accident. Cloned bodies have been prepared for funeral. August 14th, 2003 Massive power outage across Northeast United States and throughout Canada. Due to the initial failure of multiple SCP generators, Site-62 was without power for 53 minutes. During those 53 minutes, those on site were completely without any source of light. They reported sensing creatures and people, although no abnormal entities could be seen or felt. Selected facility personnel were allowed to read <laughs> Appendix A and said the creatures sensed were of humanoid size, but otherwise similar to the massive green creature described. Space-Time Anomalies SCP-004 seems to propagate spatio-temporal anomalies. Personnel leaving the facility report losing time. Those who have been in the site for weeks insist that they had only been in the facility for several days, and records of work completed and supplies consumed support their claims. Other temporal anomalies involve SCP-004-2 through 13, especially the reappearance of SCP-004-CAS-01 and SCP-004-CAS-02 exactly years after using SCP-004-1. It has been assigned to investigate all aspects of these time anomalies. Spatial anomalies include the impossibly large dimensions of the area opened by SCP-004-7. Similarly, the 2003 blackout incident suggests that there exists an alternate plane of existence within the same space that Site-62 occupies. Additional Notes Testing on SCP-004 reveals that 10 of the keys open SCP-004-1 on a dimension where the laws of physics and topology are significantly different than those of our home dimension. Test subjects meeting these hostile conditions are torn apart their body parts deposited in various locations, only three of which have been verified to be on Earth. Material deposited at two of these points appears immediately. Material deposited at the third appears exactly years into the future. The other seven locations are currently unknown. Current testing focuses on two avenues of research. The first is finding ways to survive SCP-004's hostile topologies. The second, data expunged suggests that SCP-004-2 through 13 may open doors other than SCP-004-1. Appendix A Mental Health Effects of SCP-004-12 All Class D personnel using SCP-004-12 return in a catatonic state, unable to speak. Some may have enough energy left to try to claw out their eyes. Of the 16 subjects, only 4 have survived. 
only one has regained speech following long-term psychotherapy. He was able to tell the psychiatrist that he saw a massive green creature, so large that much of its body extended beyond his field of view. He reported innate fear and sudden recognition, as if it were something buried deep in his primal fears, and forced implantation of incomprehensible memories. Subject displays acute anterograde and retrograde amnesia. Appendix B, additional information. Item number, SCP-004-14. Date of discovery, September 2nd, 1950. Origin of object. Object was discovered elsewhere in factory area, in the previously undiscovered manager's office. Description. Object appears as a large unvarnished wooden box. The box may be unlocked by the safe key, SCP-004-7, as well as five of the unsafe keys. Upon unlocking SCP-004-14 with SCP-004-7, the box opens automatically on hinges. The volume of the space inside is precisely five times greater than the outer dimensions imply. Items placed within while the lid remains open do not affect the weight or any other properties of the box. When the lid is closed and locked, however, all items inside vanish irretrievably. Personnel locked inside the box are also irretrievable, although losing personnel in this fashion appears to affect significantly the dreams experienced by Data Expunged. SCP-001 is an O5's tale. Good evening, Doctor. No, no, don't stand up. And yes, I am who you think I am. Let's not make any more of this than it is. You know my number, and I know enough about you to make a duplicate that even your mother wouldn't be able to tell apart from the real you. No, that's not a threat, just a fact. Now, as to my business here, it seems you have stumbled upon something above your clearance. Well, no. Stumbled is not the right word. Dug up? Perhaps. And you are getting to the point where further digging would end in some fairly lethal gunshot wounds. This would be a sad state of affairs, as you are otherwise quite a good researcher. Therefore, you are getting something very few people in the Foundation ever get. An explanation. Yes, we were alerted when you first started digging into SCP-001. Every researcher who's been around for a while looks into it. Most are satisfied when they uncover the angel with the flaming sword. It's buried under enough levels. But then, you started looking into the factory, and that is when I knew you wouldn't stop. So, here it is, plain and simple. The factory is SCP. 001. But it will never be written up. It was a choice I made early on in the creation of the Foundation, and a choice I still stand by. You researchers are far too curious. I'm not sure which scares me worse, that we'll never understand the Factory, or that we one day will. Ah well, I'm sure you're eager to learn more. The Factory was built in 1835. Back then, it was known as the Anderson Factory named after James Anderson, a rather well-to-do industrialist. It was built in, well, we'll just say America, and was the largest factory yet designed, a good mile across at its widest, three stories tall throughout, with a special seven-story tower by the front gate that Anderson lived in. It was designed to be the ultimate factory, capable of taking care of everything, including the housing of workers. People could be born, work, live, and die without ever leaving the confines of the factory. And work they did on everything, from cattle raising and slaughtering to textiles to everything else under the sun. Now, no one knows whether James Anderson was actually a Satan worshiper. It's just as likely that he followed some kind of pagan gods. What is known is that he was very exact in the building of his factory and in the placement of his machinery within it. Survivors claim the floor was engraved with arcane symbols that were only visible when blood flowed across them. But then, the survivors claimed a lot of things. What is known is that Anderson made his money on the blood and sweat, and sometimes body parts, of the lower class. His journals indicate he thought of them as less than human. 
being put on this earth only to serve his will. Of course, at that time, no one knew about his predilections, and so people flocked to the factory. A place to both work and live at the same time. Well, of course people wanted in. Never mind the harsh hours, working conditions, sadistic security force, and all the rest. Factory workers were forced to work 16-hour days, work only shutting down on Sundays between sunrise and sunset. Workers were not given individual rooms, instead sharing rooms with eight other people, sleeping in shifts of three. Medical attention was unheard of. If you were injured in the course of your duties, which most people were, you were expected to just keep working. Anyone too injured to work was dragged off by the security, never to be heard from again. For 40 years, the Anderson factory cranked out all sorts of things for people. Meat, clothes, weapons. Never mind that the beef might be mixed with human. Don't care that the weapons were forged in blood. No attention need be paid that the clothes were dyed with... Well, you get the idea. Rumors leaked out. But the products were so good, why bother? Until someone got out. I never met the brave soul who managed to escape, but she managed to meet with President Grant, and in 1875, he enlisted my aid. At the time I was, well, it doesn't matter. We'll say I was military, kind of, and that my people were the same. 150 good men and some few women, who were often given jobs that weren't supposed to be common knowledge. We'd been cleaning out some Confederate holdouts and some of the worst things we found down south. So, we did some research, didn't like what we saw, and went in, loaded for bear. I don't actually remember much about the night it all went down. Most of it blends together in my head. I get flashes sometimes of the people chained to the line, living next to dead, Damned hard to tell which was which. Children working underneath machines. The majority of the flesh scoured from their bones by the great wheels and cogs. And the other things. No, I'm alright. I haven't thought about that night for a very long time. The security force wasn't much of a problem. But then, Anderson's creations showed up. He'd been taking the injured workers and, well experimenting on them. Men, if you could call them men, with multiple arms, sewn together, some of them combined with animals, horrible monstrosities out of mankind's worst nightmares. They kept coming, wave after wave of not quite living creatures. I lost a lot of good people that night. And then, we found Anderson's breeding pits. Girls as young as eight chained to the walls forced to be nothing more than... <laughs> I'm sorry. Even today, more than a century later, the memory makes me see red. When we finally found Anderson cowering in his office, we hung him from his tower window with his own entrails. As he died, he laughed, saying it didn't matter. We could kill him, but his factory, the factory, would go on. He was still laughing 24 hours later, when we finally cut him down, had him drawn and quartered, and then burned the remains. The entire time he uttered blasphemies that I don't like to think about. We spent a week cleaning that place out, freeing the workers, putting down the things we found in the basements in many lightless rooms. We pulled out things that were useful, stocked them in a house near the gate, tried to make sense of everything. 150 of us went into that hell pit that night, and only 93 came out. By the end of that week, we were down to 71, but the things we found in there, my god. Well, you've been with the Foundation a while, they wouldn't seem as amazing to you, but we found toy guns that shot real bullets, a yo-yo that would flay the skin from anyone it touched, hammers that only worked on human flesh. A breed of skeletal horse that ran faster than anything we'd ever seen. Cloaks that seemed woven from the night itself and let men access a shadowy dimension that... <laughs> I, I get away from myself. We found tools, both wondrous and horrible. And we were faced with a choice. I gathered my highest ranking... Well, we'll call them officers. To me. 
and we tried to figure out what we would do. They all had opinions. The chaplain, he had gone a little crazed, thought all these objects must be miracles sent from God, holy relics to be worshipped. Marshall and his little toady Dawkins thought there was a fortune to be made here, making and selling these things to the highest bidder. The engine we all called Bass, due to his deep speaking voice, he called these things an abomination, and declared that we should hunt down and destroy everything we could find. And Smith thought we should take this stuff back to the president. The only one without an opinion was the old man, but he never said much of anything anyways. We argued for hours, days trying to work it out. Me, I thought we were sitting on a gold mine all right, but that we could use these things, these objects, to hunt down some of the scary things we'd run into down south, the other monsters this world had to offer, and use this factory for good, as a place to contain these things, find a way to make them work for our fellow man, or at least protect our fellow man from having to deal with them. I'm sure you can figure out what happened. The chaplain snuck away in the night with his devotees, taking a couple of small items with him. Marshall we kicked out when we found him, abusing his authority. He promised he'd get revenge, and that little Dawkins shit led the rest of their group off with some of the juicier items. Bass and his people tried to light the whole damn thing on fire, then just left when it didn't work, and Smith left to report back to the president. I did manage to get him to promise me he'd tell Grant the factory had been destroyed. I had big plans for that place. Of course, it was kinda hard to follow through on big plans when you only have 12 other people to work with. But it was a start, and it worked. For a while, we had these amazing toys, and finding people to work with us was easy. Back then, going off the grid was as simple as leaving town. We knew what we wanted. We knew what we could be. Leventhal set out getting us backing. A simple invention here, some well-invested money there. It all worked out. White and Jones set out getting us other backing. In our previous work, we'd found out some interesting things about people. Some secrets that powerful men didn't want getting out. And with our new position helping keep secrets, we got more people asking us to deal with their secrets. Blackmail is a dirty word, but it works. Bright, Argent, and Lumineux got to work cataloging the items. Light and Bright's wife, the nurse, they made sure we kept ourselves healthy. <laughs> no, it's just remembering Light. She had such unusual ideas about hygiene for the time. Brilliant woman. Chav, Flesher, and Karnoff dealt with training the troops. Tesla and Tamlin were in charge of figuring out how to take advantage of the items without making it obvious. We were amazing. The city we built around the factory, which we took to calling Site Alpha, was self-supporting. Agents, researchers, operatives of all sorts. Not by those names, of course, but those positions. We expanded. <sighs> I'm sorry, I am an old man. I know I do not look it, but the body lies. The mind doesn't always remember right. And sometimes I get lost in my memories. Things get confused, but the long and simple of it is this. We used the factory. It always seemed to have more empty rooms to store things in. Back then, that was the word for them, things. No skips then, no. We thought we had the factory tamed. That's one of the reasons I refused to quit this job. If there's anything I can do here, it's remind people that we will never tame these things. Contain them, yes, but as we saw with Abel, tame them? Never. After a decade or so, we were pretty organized. The 13 original of us were being called by numbers, not names. We knew how to make things work. And if a thing or two vanished inside of the factory, still? And the occasional D-Class? What? Yes, we had D-Class back then. Disposables. That's where the D comes from. Had to have someone to test things on. Tesla and Tamlin were both very firm about that. But yes, sometimes we lost people who didn't matter. Adam, sorry, Dr. Bright, was fond of saying it was the factory taking its toll. You can't get something for nothing. 1911 was when it all went wrong. Things 
We called them fairies, an entire race of things living beside us. They could look the same as you or I. The only obvious difference was an allergy to iron. Yes, that's why we called them fairies. No, you haven't heard of them. Why? Well, because it's the one time the Foundation wiped out an entire race of things. Root and branch. And I'm the one who did it. We'd been hunting them for some time. We'd run into them a time or two before, come out on top. So, when a certain royal asked us for help, of course we were eager to get them in our debt. We've always loved having people in our debt. We sent a team to help out, take care of what we thought was a hunting party. The next time we saw them, their heads were on poles, attached to the saddles of the creatures the fairies rode, when they attacked the factory. It was horrible. Three words, but they convey so much. I've never... I'm sorry, please, give me a moment. <clears throat> I've never told this part to anyone. You should consider yourself lucky. And if you ever tell anyone any of what I'm about to impart on you, I will not just kill you, but everyone who shares your DNA in the worst ways possible. You'll think Procedure 110 Montauk is a walk in the park compared to what I do to you. <sighs> we lost. The things came and they destroyed us, rode over our emplacements, slaughtered our people, shrugged off our weapons like they were nothing. I watched my 13 go down, left and right, just trying to hold the factory. And I, I, their leader, their friend, their father figure, godfather to the Bright's four young children, confidant, sometimes lover, always the confessor, I ran. I ran like a scared little boy, deep into the dark guts of the factory. I was chased by the things, always just one step ahead. I could hear them behind me, feel their breath upon my neck, and... I came to a door I'd never seen before. A bronze door, covered in Arabic script of some sort. I'd never been one for languages, especially not the curvy bullshit the musclemen use, but I didn't care. They were coming for me, and I threw the door open and dived through it. Everything inside was different. There was a feeling of peace, that nothing could hurt me here. The light was this dark red, but still felt right. My ears were filled with the steady thrumming of a gigantic heartbeat, and in front of me were the remains of Anderson. It spoke to me then but I'll be damned if I could tell you exactly what it said. What it told me was more meaning than exact. It offered me hope. It told me, it told me that each of the things we had used from the factory, no matter what we did with them, fed it, helped it grow. But if the fairies took the factory, they would destroy it, and we couldn't have that. It offered me a deal. It could remove this event. Make it have never happened. All I needed to give it was... Us. I didn't want to. I knew it was a bad idea, but then I saw them again. My family, my friends. Dead. Dead by the hands of those bastards. I agreed. It smiled. And I found myself once more upon the ramparts, watching the horde of fairies crest the hill my foundation alive once more. In my hands was a weapon. I won't bore you with the details, but we slaughtered them. And with these new weapons, continued to slaughter them. Everywhere they lived, everywhere they bred. My fellow O5s questioned my decision, thinking we should save some in case we might ever need them. I overruled them. We moved away from the factory, shut it down, moved our things out of there. We changed the name from things to special containment protocols, focused on containing them, not anything else. The others were curious, but understood I had my reasons. I boarded up the factory, locked it shut, buried it under a ton of rubble, saying it was too dangerous. I thought, 
thought I'd gotten away with it. Until I found a thing on my desk. One of the old toy guns that shot real bullets. And it had the factory label on it. I've sent people in from time to time to see what it might be doing. Last time I sent people in to look, there was nothing there. We keep finding factory items out there. I can't help but think of how many more we don't find. The people who use them and keep it hidden. I think back to the body telling me how each item used gave energy to the factory. I never asked it. Energy for what? I don't think I want to know. What do we give it? D-class, mostly. Where did you think all those bodies went? There's a place. Bodies are left, and they vanish. Everyone thinks I'm a genius for figuring it out. Sometimes... Sometimes I have defeated other things. Researchers. Agents. They never know it's coming. It just reaches out and takes them. But, in the end, we're doing more good by being here. Whatever the factory wants, whatever it is, we're doing good here. I have to believe that. And now you know. Are you happy? I didn't think so. Why tell you? I'm getting old, Everett. Should I die, someone will have to keep feeding it. Maybe you'll be different. Maybe you'll figure out how to stand up to it. Item number, SCP-15. Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-15 is impossible to move and is contained on site. A gap of at least two meters or six feet needs to be maintained around the entire structure containing SCP-15 at all times, and no structures of any kind are to make contact with SCP-15's current containment structure. Exploration is permissible, but only in teams of three with full safety lines and GPS tracking. Any protrusions from SCP-15 must be capped and sealed immediately, with the new site recorded and logged. No aggressive action is to be made within SCP-15, no hand or power tools are allowed anywhere inside SCP-15. No repairs or maintenance are to be made anywhere on SCP-15. Description SCP-15 is a mass of pipes, vents, boilers, and other various plumbing apparatus, completely filling a warehouse in- The pipes appear to grow when not under observation, attempting to connect to nearby structures via sewer systems and underground plumbing. SCP-15 contains, at current estimate, over 190 kilometers, or 120 miles, of pipes, ranging in diameter from 2.5 centimeters to over 1 meter. Some pipes appear new, while others are rusted and leaking. Pipes have been reported as being made of bone, wood, steel, pressed ash, human flesh, glass, and granite. No pipes composed of lead, PVC plastic, copper, or any other traditional material for the production of pipes have been found. SCP-15 reacts to tools and aggression. Any personnel acting violently, carrying tools, or attempting to damage or repair SCP-15 in any way will trigger a reaction. Any pipes near the subject will burst, spraying on the subject for several seconds before the flow suddenly stops. Pipes have been reported containing oil, mercury, rats, a species of insect not yet identified, ground glass, seawater, entrails, and molten iron. Pipes will continue to burst around the subject until death or retreat. SCP-15 was cut back to its current structure after attaching to 11 other structures in the area. Currently, 11 personnel have been killed, and 20 more are still missing. Reports have been made of banging and screaming coming from within SCP-15. Item Number SCP-022 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures A vault door has been installed following Incident 022-827 to seal SCP-022. It is to remain locked at all times, with the sole exception being the appearance of an instance of SCP-022-1. The original door to SCP-022 was destroyed during Incident 022-827, with attempts at replacement being met with failure. Security cameras have been installed to monitor for instances of SCP-022-1. 
In the event that an instance of SCP-022-1 appears, automated systems should incinerate it the moment it leaves SCP-022. At this point, the vault door may be unlocked to admit cleanup crews. Should the automated systems fail to destroy the instance of SCP-022-1, response teams are cleared to enter and neutralize it. Under no circumstances may any living human enter SCP-022 except at the order of Class 4 personnel for testing purposes. Class 4 personnel may also order instances of SCP-022-1 to be captured and held. However, they may not be removed from SCP-022 containment facilities. Description SCP-022 is a morgue in the basement of Hospital in Great Britain. Until 1980, there were no reported anomalous occurrences within the morgue. Reports of strange activity were first received in November of 1980. The area was soon quarantined by the Foundation, with an official story being released that the entire building had been condemned. The reason for the sudden manifestation of its strange properties remains under investigation. Periodically, a random drawer within the morgue will open to reveal a cadaver under a covered sheet. After approximately six minutes open, the cadaver will animate and attempt to leave the morgue. At this point, the cadaver is given the designation SCP-022-1. In some cases, the cadaver will be too damaged or decomposed to successfully exit SCP-022 or even rise from the table it lies on. In this case, SCP-022-1 will typically struggle and twitch on the table until expiration occurs. Should an instance of SCP-022-1 expire while remaining on the table, the table slides back into the drawer which then shuts. Reports indicate that the scent of burnt tissue is evident immediately following such an event. The energy source that sustains instances of SCP-022-1 is currently unknown. Instances do not breathe, eat, or sleep, and their bodies produce no heat. Analysis of SCP-022-1 following expiration has discovered no abnormal organs or chemicals present. They appear to be fully human cadavers. Instances also possess physical strength that exceeds that of normal humans. Though direct testing has proven problematic, researchers estimate the strength increase to be approximately 500 newtons, 112 pounds, of lifting force greater than what one would expect of a human body sharing a similar condition. Analysis is underway to determine if this effect is connected to the unknown power source, or if it is an entirely separate phenomenon. When body parts are severed from SCP-022-1, the portion with the greatest mass retains its effects. All other pieces become inert. Destruction of the head or brain does not neutralize SCP-022-1. Instead, the lower torso and limbs remain animate. Complete tissue destruction appears to be the only method of successfully terminating instances of SCP-022-1. Left alone, instances of SCP-022-1 will simply expire. All motion ceases, and they appear to become normal cadavers again. The amount of time this takes depends on how damaged the body is and the rate of decomposition, and can take anywhere between two days and three weeks. Investigation has revealed that the bodies acting as SCP-022-1 match the description of cadavers reported to have been stolen from morgues across the country. The mechanism for this transfer is currently being researched. Adding any new matter to SCP-022 has thus far proved impossible. Any object that enters SCP-022 disappears shortly after passing through the door, leaving no trace. This includes inanimate objects and biological specimens. So long as an instance of SCP-022-1 possesses a functioning mouth, tongue, and trachea, it is able to communicate fully with researchers. See the following interview log for details. Interview Log 022-751 Each of the following interviews begin in much the same way. The instance of SCP-022-1 will typically be hysterical until Foundation personnel are able to calm or restrain them. These portions have been omitted. Date March 1980 Interviewee SCP-022-1-2 Interviewer, Dr. B Notes, SCP-022-1-2 was the second instance of SCP-022-1 that the Foundation discovered. 
the first having been destroyed on site by Foundation agents. SCP-022-1-2 had the body of an Asian male, approximately 54 years old. Its chest had been stitched up, evidence of an autopsy. Begin log. Doctor, please identify yourself. SCP-022-1-2. My... My name is John... What... What the hell is going on? Doctor, that's what we're trying to figure out, John. How did you get to this... state? SCP-022-1-2. I... I don't know. I was driving my car. Coming home from... Never mind. I was driving, and I crashed. Doctor, then what happened? SCP-022-1-2. Nothing. I woke up here. Please. This has to be unintelligible. Doctor, so you remember being in a car accident, then woke up here in the morgue. Do you have any idea how you got here? SCP-022-1-2. I didn't get here. Don't you get it? This isn't me. I'm not me. Doctor, what do you mean you aren't you? At this point, SCP-022-1-2 became severely agitated and had to be physically restrained. This required six agents, due to the strength increase associated with instances of SCP-022-1. Eventually, SCP-022-1-2 was calmed, and the interview proceeded. Doctor, now, would you please explain what you meant? SCP-022-1-2, this is not me. I saw my reflection in the steel. I'm not some old Asian f This isn't me! And log. Following the last statement, SCP-022-1-2 began to smash its head against the wall. Once further restrained, it began to scream unintelligibly for several hours before falling silent. It continued to struggle, though apparently unable to speak, for an additional six days until it finally ceased motion. During this time, it continued decomposing at a natural rate. An examination of the body following this interview was unable to determine a cause of death, as many of the internal organs had been removed. The only injury that did not appear to be a result of a previous surgery or autopsy was a damaged trachea. Date, March. 1980. Interviewee. SCP-022-1-5 Interviewer Dr. R Notes SCP-022-1-5 animated shortly after D-5619 was sent into SCP-022 and subsequently disappeared. SCP-022-1-5 had the body of an approximately 12-year-old female, missing its right arm and a large portion of its torso. Following the incident with SCP-022-1-3, all instances of SCP-022-1 are physically restrained before being introduced to valuable personnel, with SCP-022-1-5 being no exception. Begin log. Doctor, please state your name. SCP-022-1-5. What did you bastards do to me? Doctor, please state your name. SCP-022-1-5 What the f*** did you do to me? Doctor, we have done nothing to you. Now please state your name. SCP-022-1-5 You know who I f am. Doctor, refresh my memory then, please. SCP-022-1-5 I'm the guinea pig you just f***ed up. Don't tell me you forgot me, Dr. A- Doctor are you D-5619? SCP-022-1-5 In the flesh, and for your information, jackass, my name is Now change me back, you son of a bitch. Change me back! End log. At this point, Dr. asked SCP-022-1-5 several questions to verify its identity. Though its identity was confirmed to be that of D-5619, no further useful information was gained from SCP-022-1-5. It was kept in a holding cell until expiring two days later. After three weeks, the body of D-5619 animated as SCP-022-1-7. In a brief interview with SCP-022-1-7, 
It claimed to be an 89-year-old female. Addendum 022-001. A request has been submitted to create a new entrance to SCP-022 by removing a portion of the south wall. Request pending approval. Addendum 022-002. A pile of matter was discovered on the floor of the room directly above SCP-022. It appeared to contain all matter that had been sent into SCP-022, with the exception of humans. All materials appeared broken and worn down. Metallic components were covered in large amounts of rust, with all biological parts being in various stages of decomposition. Testing revealed that the time between inserting an object into SCP-022 and it reappearing above to be precisely 183 seconds. Humans who enter, however, do not appear in said pile. Instead, humans appear to become integrated into the morgue and may later animate as instances of SCP-022-1. Item Number SCP-024 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Due to its nature, SCP-024 cannot be moved to a secure location, so security measures must be placed on site. To conceal its location, five identical-looking replicas have been erected around SCP-024. A tight security perimeter must be maintained around SCP-024's compound at all times, with separate security teams guarding SCP-024 and its replicas. None of the security teams except for team leaders will be informed of the location of SCP-024. SCP-024 must be secured with magnetically sealed blast doors and reinforced armored walls to prevent unauthorized entry. Under no circumstances can any security or research personnel enter SCP-024. Only D-Class personnel are allowed entry, and strictly for research purposes only. All researchers are to observe and experiment with SCP-024 from the Remote Observation Lab. Any personnel attempting to leave the Remote Observation Lab or enter SCP-024 without prior approval from a Level 4 researcher must be immediately apprehended with termination authorized. Should containment be breached, or SCP-024's true nature compromised, then the entire compound must be destroyed via specialized demolition charges planted throughout the compound. Description SCP-024 is an abandoned soundstage that was once owned by However, SCP-024 itself has been abandoned since 19 and it is unknown whether its special properties manifested before or after its abandonment. SCP-024 is located in the heart of and was initially discovered when a group of teenage youths broke into the abandoned compound. The testimony of the lone winner when she turned herself into the police was enough to have Foundation assets mobilized to contain SCP-024. Upon entering SCP-024, visitors are immediately greeted by an anonymous announcer who communicates via intercom and is able to hear and comprehend the voices of people within SCP-024. The announcer will inform the contestants that they are about to take part in a game show in which the winners will win fabulous prizes, but will also warn that the game will be extremely hazardous and that the losers will never leave SCP-024. It is at this point the announcer presents the choice of whether to stay or leave SCP-024. Contestants who accept will continue to participate in the game while those who decline are immediately expelled from SCP-024. Contestants that win the game or decline to participate may never enter SCP-024 again, as entry is denied by an impenetrable invisible barrier. It is then that the contestants are led to the actual game. The style, composition, and appearance of the game always changes in every individual playthrough but the game is always centered around a long, elaborate obstacle course that the contestants must navigate through. The rules also vary. Some playthroughs may only allow a single winner, while others encourage the creation of teams to win the game. More often than not, the obstacles seen in these games range from incredibly benign to extremely hazardous and life-threatening. As the contestants attempt to negotiate the course, the announcer will continually update their status and actively participate in the game, often giving advice, conversing with contestants, and adding new rules. As the game progresses, the obstacles become significantly more dangerous and difficult to overcome, 
and it is not surprising to have the entire pool of contestants succumb to the rigors of the obstacle course. If such an event happens, the announcer will express sadness at the lack of a winner, and SCP-024 will shut down, resetting only when a new batch of contestants enter. Any attempts to break the rules, such as assaulting other contestants and deliberately bypassing obstacles, are met by extreme violence. The announcer will call out the offending contestant, who will be quickly and forcefully ejected from the course by Studio Guardians. These Studio Guardians will immediately materialize within SCP-024 when called upon by the announcer, and disappear when not needed. The contestant will never be seen again. When a winner is declared, he or she will receive a random grand prize. Any contestants that have survived the course but failed to win are immediately declared losers by the announcer. The lights will switch off, and the winner will immediately appear outside of SCP-024 with his or her prize, while the losers completely disappear. However, the most mysterious aspect of SCP-024 is that after every game, a VHS tape or DVD will appear in the mailbox outside of SCP-024's main entrance. This recording is a complete record of the entire game that was previously played, even though winners have claimed that they have never seen any cameras or recording devices inside SCP-024. Also, more strangely, a live studio audience can be seen in the background, cheering on the contestants. Again, winners have claimed not to have seen a live studio audience while inside SCP-024. Addendum 1 so far, the list of prizes awarded to winners has included, but is not limited to, cash prizes, electronics, various consumer goods, cars, collectibles, full paid vacations to various countries, data expunged. Close examination of these prizes have confirmed that they are completely genuine and possess no unusual abilities or characteristics whatsoever. There appears to be no consistent pattern for what the prizes will be. Addendum 2. In an attempt to track where the losers are taken, GPS locator beacons were planted on subjects D-124 through D-135, when Group D-245 was sent into SCP-024. When the losers were taken away, all signals from the beacons were lost. Whether this is because the beacons were destroyed, or because the losers were taken to an area that cannot be located via GPS, is currently unknown. Addendum 3. The announcer living within SCP-024 appears to be sentient and aware of events that take place outside of the compound. During the test of Group D-523, which consisted only of Dr. The announcer instead engaged in a conversation with Dr. Analysis of the conversations have shown that the majority of the subjects are centered around pop culture and information distributed through television, implying that SCP-024 somehow is able to access and interpret television signals. Cutting all power and signal lines, as well as removing any potential wireless receiving equipment on SCP-024, does not affect SCP-024 in any way. When it became clear that no other contestants would participate, the announcer kindly asked Dr. to leave SCP-024 and suggested he return with more contestants. Addendum 4 the studio guardians that the announcer uses to enforce the rules vary in appearance every game, just like the course. If they appear, the guardians will always be dressed in a manner that matches with the theme of the obstacle course. The only common attributes all guardians share are the possession of humanoid appearance, ability to suddenly appear and disappear, superhuman strength, and face-concealing masks or headgear. However, Winners have claimed that the Guardians have no apparent shape or form inside SCP-024, instead appearing as huge shadowy figures that engulf the offender. Item Number SCP-026 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-026 is to remain securely locked and boarded up at all times when there is no research ongoing. Alarms are set to alert the Foundation in case of entry by civilians or other agencies. Description: SCP-026 is a three-story public school building. Built in- It has two wings connected to a central foyer. It was declared condemned in- After it was found, the floor plan didn't match up to the building's blueprints. It came to the Foundation's attention after several disappearances in the area, 
were linked to visits to the abandoned building. The following text has been struck through. The building demonstrates spatial anomalies. Its internal space is much greater than the external surface of the building would allow. Hallways display variable length, while stairways have differing numbers of steps going up or down. The number of rooms off the hallways changes each time they are counted. Attempts to reach the far ends of the hallways have met with failure thus far. Entrance through the fire escapes located at the ends of the hallways leads to doors approximately midway down the length of the halls. End of strike through. There is considerable graffiti on the interior walls of the school. Most appears typical, including gang signs, names, and street art. However, the graffiti fades and reappears, changing location. Writing on chalkboards and bulletin boards changes in a similar fashion. Subjects typically found range from standard school subjects, mathematics, literature, biology, to more esoteric subjects, such as quantum entanglement and eugenics. One researcher reported one board detailing information about SCP, but photographic evidence showed only a blank slate. The phrase, the children used to sing, has appeared multiple times in various places throughout the building but there is currently no explanation for its significance. A number of unconscious subjects have been found in the building, mostly of high school age, ranging from 12 to 18. They are dressed in accordance to the school's dress code, circa Several have been identified as former students or faculty of the school who disappeared after the school shut down, in at least one case more than 10 years after the closure. It is currently unknown how they were transported back into SCP-026. All attempts to wake the subjects while inside the building have failed. On being removed from the grounds of SCP-026, the subjects wake abruptly. They experience a period of confusion, before dying from extremely rapid dehydration, followed by advanced decomposition. No useful intelligence has been recovered from the subjects to date. The inability to wake subjects extends to those who fall asleep on the grounds of SCP-026. Though the rapid dehydration only seems to affect those who have been found on the grounds of the school. See Incident Report 026-12. Note 026-A. Robotic explorations and video feeds have shown that the apparent spatial anomalies are caused by changes in the perceptions of observers, rather than actual spatial phenomena. For this reason, SCP-026 does not require the expertise of Mobile Task Force Row 8, Roadside Picnickers, at this time. Update. Further exploration has shown that some spatial phenomena do occur. See the exploration logs for more details. Note 026-B. The contents of notepads, books, and pieces of paper have been observed to disappear, only to reappear on surfaces within SCP-026. New writings have appeared, mostly drawn from graffiti or textbooks. Caution should be exercised in bringing documents onto the grounds of SCP-026. Note 026-C. Several Class D personnel exposed to SCP-026 have disappeared from Foundation control, only to reappear inside the anomalous building. The subjects in question had previously complained of dreams identical to those experienced by Agent Malik. Incident Report 026-12. During a routine security check of SCP-026, Agent Malik was found unconscious by his partner, Agent Jones, in the main foyer. Initial attempts at rousing Agent Malik were ineffective, so he was moved for transportation to site. Upon leaving the grounds of SCP-026, he woke abruptly in a state of agitation. When questioned, he revealed that he had been dreaming of a classroom setting. This dream has been consistent throughout all subjects who have fallen asleep within the grounds of SCP-026. Interview Log 026-01 Interview with former principal at SCP-026. Agent, thank you for your time, Mr. Principal, not at all. If there's one thing I have plenty of these days, it's time. Agent, so, let's get down to business. You were principal of back in, is that correct? Principal, yes, that's right. Agent, what can you tell us about that? Principal, well, you've heard the stories, I'm sure. Folks say it was haunted. I don't know about that, but things did seem strange toward the end. Agent, tell me about them. Principal, let's see. There were the stairs, of course. You've heard about that, right? People would count 15 coming up and 16 coming back down. I'm sure there was a trick to it, like an optical illusion. 
but I never could figure it out, and we had a history book that turned up completely blank. I suppose these seem rather tame, but you know how it is. Little things add up. People tell stories. Agent, tell me about the dreams. Principal, the dreams. Oh, yes. People were complaining about nightmares. Mostly students, but a few of the staff as well. It was always about school never ending. We joked about it at first, but more people talked about it. I didn't put much credence into it, but, well, when we found the blueprints didn't match up with the school, it seemed easier to just move to a new building. The schoolhouse was old anyway, and we wanted a fresh start. And, just like that, things seemed to settle back to normal. Agent, I see. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Principal. Hmm. It's not really much, but maybe we'll make a nice footnote in that book you're writing. I still sometimes have dreams about being in my office, back at the old schoolhouse. Sometimes I'm just doing paperwork. Sometimes I'm talking to someone, but it's always back behind the desk, just like old times. But gradually, I notice something's a bit off. The bell's ringing, but I don't hear anyone in the hallway. No students hurrying in or out of the classroom. No chatter. No footsteps. Nothing but the bell. And it doesn't stop. The crazy thing is that I never notice it's a dream until then. I've been retired for ten years, but until I notice the bell, I think everything's normal. Crazy, isn't it? Agent, I think it's very interesting. Thank you very much. If you think of anything else, don't hesitate to give me a call. Principal, anytime. Interview Log 026-08 Doctor, please have a seat. Agent Walker, thank you. Doctor, let's get down to business. I understand you're requesting a transfer out of field work. Would you like to talk about that? Agent Walker, I'd rather not. Doctor, it's your choice. However, I can't approve a transfer without reason. Agent Walker, look, I... You've seen my record. You know I worked on 26, right? Doctor, I've read the report. Agent Walker, I was there the first time we took one of the sleepers out. A lot of them were adults when they disappeared, but they're kids again when we find them. So, I see this 16-year-old boy just kind of shrivel away. I had nightmares that night. Doctor, you're supposed to report any unusual dreams after contacting a potentially mind-altering phenomenon. Agent Walker, it hadn't been declared a mind screw yet. We just thought it was a weird space thing. We were just watching it until the picnickers got there. And it was a shock, you know? We weren't expecting anything like that. Anyway, I got over it quick enough. I'd seen worse. I once had a guy melt while I was holding on to him. Doctor. I see. What happened next? Agent Walker. Nothing for a while. I went in a couple of times, but didn't see anything too weird. But, look, I know I should have reported it. But one of my buddies had just been disappeared after getting touched by some weird SCP, and I don't want it to happen to me. Doctor, you've been affected by an SCP. Agent Walker, I... Yeah, it was a week later. I was dozing in the back of the van, and I started dreaming. Doctor, can you describe this dream? Agent Walker, just like the others. You've read the reports, right? Doctor, pretend that I haven't. For the record, Agent Walker. Agent Walker. All right. I'm in a classroom. It's just like one of the ones in 026, but new, not falling apart. I knew the teacher's name. I knew who was sitting by me, even though I'd never seen most of them before. The bell started ringing, but no one moved. I raised my hand, but the teacher didn't notice. Finally, I tried to leave, but the door wouldn't open. Then I noticed something strange with my hand. It had color. Everything else was black and white, but I felt like I was the one who was wrong, out of place, and that's when I woke up. The van was leaving. No one else noticed I'd been asleep. Doctor, and you didn't think to report this. Agent Walker, like I said, I was scared, and this was before they found Malik. I figured it was just another nightmare, nothing weird, and after Malik had his dream, well, they didn't do anything with him, so I figured it wasn't a big deal. Doctor, he was put on observation. You should have been as well, for your own safety and for the safety of others. Agent Walker, you paper pushers think it's all so easy, don't you? Sitting behind a desk all day, you don't know what it's like. Well, things aren't so clear out there. 
Not when you're the one hunting talking cats in a sewer, or waiting to see if you're the one who's not going to come back this time. Agent Walker was visibly distressed. It was several minutes before he calmed down enough to continue the interview. Agent Walker. Anyway, it wasn't until later that we connected the dreams with the sleepers. Not until they found those Class Ds on the second floor. Still, I thought I might be okay. I wasn't actually inside of 26 when I dreamed. I wasn't sure until the dreams started. Doctor, you're having reoccurrences? Agent Walker. Yeah, they started six months ago. It's the same dream. But each time, it takes me a little longer to notice it isn't real. And when I look at my hands, they're a little more gray. End interview 026-31 Note, Agent Walker has since been given a Class A amnesiac and returned to field work. Exploration Log 026-4 Exploration conducted by Agent- Alright, I'm walking into the lobby. Walls are mostly bare concrete, a little paint here and there. Graffiti everywhere. A few beer bottles, some other trash. Looks like just another abandoned building. Okay, I'm making my way up the stairs. More graffiti on the walls. Okay, I'm going into the hallway. The peeling paint is kind of creepy. Looks like some sort of sheet fungus. Reminds me of- The doors are kind of weird. Some are really close, others are far. Really irregular spacing. Doesn't match up with the blueprint you showed me. Okay, here's a classroom. Pretty empty. Some old desks. Real old, like they had in the 30s. The chalkboard's got a few math problems on it. Looks like trig. Okay, I'm going to check out another room. Back in the hallway. Heading to the next room. Desks look more modern in this room. Made from particle board. More posters here. Look to be from the 80s, I'd say. I recognize some of them from when I was a kid. Looks like Latin on the chalkboard. Yes, I'm taking pictures. Okay, back in the hallway. Heading to the next room. Several minutes of silence. There's something really screwy with this place. I could swear the room was just a few feet away, but it feels like I've been walking for hours. Anyway, I'm here. We've got sleepers. Three of them, two girls and a boy. They look to be around 14, 15. They're all wearing the same uniform. Yeah, just like you showed me. Hang on a minute while I take some pictures. At least we can figure out who they are. The furniture's pretty old looking, what's left of it. A lot of broken chairs and desks. Nothing on the walls. Chalkboards... The hell? You're not going to believe this. It's got Agent Wood's notes up there. In her handwriting, even. We're going to have to be really careful what we bring in here. Yeah, I've got pictures, don't worry. Okay, I'm going to check one more room, and then I'm out. Back in the hallway now. Heading for the next room. Another anomaly. I've been going the same direction this entire time. But I'm back at the stairs. Yeah, I'm just going to head down. I've had enough of this place for one day. I'll meet you at the door. The developed photos revealed... Exploration Log 026-12 Carried out remotely using a robotic drone via video feed. Exploring the first floor hallway. The hallway appeared in poor condition, with graffiti on the walls. Comparison with previous videos shows the graffiti has changed. Many of the same signs were present, but in different positions. Some seemed new. Doors were uniformly spaced on the wall. Some were intact, while others were cracked or missing entirely. First room in the hallway was the girls' bathroom. More graffiti on the walls. Several broken mirrors. A toilet had been removed from the wall entirely and placed in the center of the room. There was a great deal of porcelain and glass on the floor. The next room over was the boys' bathroom. This was skipped in favor of exploring the classrooms. The first classroom had no furniture. The chalkboard was broken in two. On one side of the board, there was a set of lines reading, I will not pass notes during class. Sick. The other side had fragments of a lesson on There was one poster on the wall, depicting Helen Keller. The second classroom was well furnished, with the largest number of intact desks to date, mostly made from wood and steel in a style used in the 1950s. There were two sleepers found that had not been reported in previous sweeps of the building. The first was a male teenager in a student's desk. Comparison with file 026-04 revealed him to be a former student of the school. He was reported missing 10 years after the school closed down, at age 28. The other was a woman in her mid-30s, sitting behind the teacher's desk. Her identity is still unknown. 
The chalkboard had a timeline of World War II, overlaid with an intricate piece of graffiti. The third classroom had 15 particle board desks in various states of disrepair. A map on the back wall was consistent with the socio-political conditions of 1974. A bookshelf had collapsed and spilled a set of encyclopedias onto the floor. The robot was then guided to the end of the hallway and back to the entrance. There was no sign of spatial anomalies at this time. Exploration Log 026-15 Exploration conducted by Agent Accompanied by a robotic drone. Okay, I'm in. Lobby looks like it always does. Probably some graffiti drift. Here comes the robot. The lobby was compared to previous videos. Some differences in the graffiti were noted. Otherwise, no significant changes. I'm heading upstairs now. God damn, the robot's heavy. How much crap did you load on it? You could have warned me. Gonna rest a second on the second landing. Video coming in alright? Cool, cool. First set of stairs was navigated without trouble. The second floor hallway appeared similar to the first floor hallway, though with less debris. I've caught my breath. Heading up to the third floor. Wish there was a guardrail. Next time it might be easier to carry the robot and the gear separately and load it in once it's up. The gear is pretty idiot proof. I think I could probably figure it out. Damn thing must weigh over a hundred pounds. There, on the third floor now. I count 12 doors. Weird spacing. That last door's got to be at least a hundred yards down. This place is pretty messed up. Rangefinder showed the hallway was approximately 45 meters long. Five doors on each side, evenly spaced, with one more door at the end of the hall. Eleven total. I'm heading in. There's not as much graffiti up here. A bit of debris. I'm opening one of the doors. Janitor's closet and... Hey, we've got a janitor. He's sleeping standing up. That's new. Male. Seems to be in his mid-fifties. Name tag says... Couple old broomsticks. What's left of a mop. Looks like rats have been nesting in here. They've shredded one of his pant legs. But looks like they didn't touch the sleeper himself. What? You want samples? Eh, sure. Wouldn't be the weirdest thing I've picked up for this job. Okay, I think that's it. Comparison with file 026-4 revealed the sleeper to be former janitor in SCP-026. Later analysis of the rat feces revealed recommended future exploration teams wear biohazard gear. Here's a classroom. No, no sleepers. Couple of desks intact, the rest look pretty bad. Looks like someone took a sledgehammer to the place. No, wait, I stand corrected. Baseball bat. It's leaning against the corner. There's about half a case of beer here, full cans. Looks like they left in a hurry. Hey, get the robot to face the board. There's something I want you to see. Looks like Latin to me. Could be significant. Get someone to translate it. It might be a clue to what's gone down here. The Latin was found to be a series of sentences showing different conjugations of the verb vendir, to sell. All were found in its Latin primer a textbook formerly used by the school. The baseball bat was aluminum. An analysis of the fingerprints was inconclusive. Okay, next classroom. Desks look fairly modern. 80s, I'd guess. Chalkboard's got a quote from Nicholas Nickleby on it. Yes, I'm sure. It says right there on the board. The sun does not shine upon this fair earth to meet frowning eyes. Depend upon it. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. There's an apple on the desk. Looks fresh. I'm tossing it into the drone. Okay, I'm looking out the window. Hey, are you guys still out there? Because I see kids in the schoolyard. I don't see the van or any of you. Yeah, second classroom on the right. You see me? Weird. The apple appeared fresh on the video feed. However, when removed from the sample's bin, it was in an advanced state of decomposition. The drone's feed through the window showed the foundation van on the ground and the research team looking up at the window. No children were seen in the schoolyard. Okay, you want me to head down the hallway? All right, let's see if I actually make it this time. Not holding out any hopes. Walking forward, it looks 10 feet to the next door, which would actually put it in the last room. But who's counting? I'm still here. I'm just farther than it looks. Feels like I've been walking at least a couple of hours. I'm almost there. I'm just going to take a breather. I. Okay, this is wrong. I've stopped moving, but now I'm going backwards. The hallway's moving past me. Shit, I just saw the door move past me. I'm moving forward again. That's better. 
Okay, I'm almost there. One last dash and I should make it. And I'm back with the robot. I knew it wasn't going to work. There's no way to get there, I'm telling you. The video feed showed the next door was 30 feet away. But total elapsed time from one door to the next was five minutes. In which time, Agent <laughs> meandered toward the end of the hallway. No anomalous activity was observed while he was standing still. When he neared the end of the hallway, Agent <laughs> turned around and quickly returned to the beginning of the hallway. Okay, I hear you. I've got my eyes closed. I'm walking forward. Left, got it. Going straight. Correcting left again. Correcting right now. Okay, this is going a lot faster. Okay, correcting right. Yes, right, I heard you. God damn it, I am going right. Okay, left. No, it is not the same direction. Look, if you think it's that easy, just send the robot in. The robot was able to reach the end of the hallway with no problems. Agent <laughs> attempted to follow, but was unable to keep a straight line to the end of the hallway. Just go ahead and send the bot in. I'm not going to try again until we have a better idea of what's in there. Something's keeping me out of there. We should figure out what it is before anything else. Look, if you want to know that badly, go yourself. Or request some Class Ds. I'm not going in. Deal with it. At this point, the robot opened the door and crossed the threshold into another hallway, running perpendicular to the first, 30 meters in length. No doors were visible. A single window was observed, but was situated too high for the view outside to be visible. The walls were free of graffiti. The left was a dead end while the right terminated in a left-hand turn. The robot turned right into the new hallway. After 10 meters, the unit's GPS showed it to be outside the building, though the video feed still showed the hallway. It continued to the end of the hallway and turned left. Agent was just ahead, at the beginning of the original hallway. Turning the camera behind the robot showed only the stairwell, with no sign of the second hallway. The unit's GPS showed it by Agent position at this time. I see another classroom. I don't see the robot, though. I lost track after it went through the door. What do you mean it's outside? Did it go out through the window? Look, maybe the GPS is screwy. Calm down. What do you mean turn around? What the hell am I- Oh, f Okay, that's enough. I'm calling it off for the day. We can come back after we get some Class Ds in here. Item number. SCP-028. Object Class. Safe. Special Containment Procedures No special means are needed to contain at this time, as SCP-028 has not shown any change in size, position, or shape during the entire period of its containment, but access must be restricted. Currently, SCP-028 is contained on site, site as SCP-028 is not transportable by any known means. SCP-028 is sealed in a 6 meter by 6 meter by 3 meter 20 meter by 20 meter by 10 meter foot, concrete room with a single door, with two armed personnel stationed outside. Only authorized personnel are to be allowed exposure to SCP-028, and extreme care must be taken at all times. While SCP-028 is itself harmless, the effect can be very damaging to the unprepared. See document EL-028-1125. Description: SCP-028 is located in an abandoned storage yard outside a copper mine in northern Michigan. SCP-028 has no detectable physical presence of any kind, but its effect occurs in a 2.1 meter, 7 foot cube around what is commonly held as the center of SCP-028. All forms of scanning and testing in the area of SCP-028 have shown no abnormal readings, adding or removing objects or attempting to remove dirt from under SCP-028 has no effect in altering the size or shape of SCP-028's area of effect, nor the onset or quality of the effect. Subjects entering SCP-028 are, within three to six seconds, struck by total and complete knowledge of a subject. This knowledge is thus far completely random in both size and usefulness, and sometimes goes unnoticed for extended periods of time. More profound knowledge generally has a stronger effect, with some cases expunged. See document EL-028-1125. This effect can be experienced multiple times by exiting and re-entering SCP-028, but can result in increasingly strong migraines and dizziness after two exposures. SCP-028 came to the Foundation's attention after research into news reports of a local miner 
who submitted a design for a cold fusion reactor to the US Patent Office. Mr. reported that it just came to me, like a bolt out of the blue. News and subjects were suppressed and contained after discovery of SCP-028 and the reactor designs implemented in the containment of SCP-1995. Subsequent testing of SCP-028 has yielded mixed results. Document number EL-028-1114 Partial Information Retrieval Log for January 5th Note: All knowledge is perfect, total, and eidetic. Every phone book entry for New York City in 1998. How to redesign the internal combustion engine to run on human blood, using only pre-existing parts. Note, full redesign takes four hours and runs at higher efficiency than gasoline. Location of keys for a Buick LeSabre. The proper method of care for a mole rat colony. Origin and history of 12 SCP objects. Note, the main expunged. Family history of the Blackthorn family located in London, England. Geological structure of the Earth beneath Greenland, including several unknown caves and expunged. Document number EL-028-1125 Log E-112 Subject D-1182 exposed to SCP-028. Subject began to cry and went into fetal position, showing signs of high distress. Unresponsive to questioning and outside stimulus for several days, lapsed into catatonia shortly after stating that this is not life. Subject passed into a coma and died shortly thereafter. COD was attributed to shock. E-127 Agent accidentally exposed to SCP-028. Agent showed signs of sudden surprise and bemusement. When questioned, agent requested, a moment to gather my thoughts, please. After several seconds, agent laughed, shook his head, and removed his service pistol from its holster. Agent then shot and wounded Dr. and killed Agent and before being restrained. Post-incident interrogation revealed Agent had extensive knowledge of classified Foundation activities and several SCP objects he had not been previously exposed to, including SCP-2669. Any Foundation personnel found to have entered SCP-028's area of effect are to be detained indefinitely. Document number EL-028-1128 Log Experiment 189 Subject D-9843 was exposed to SCP-028. Examination of subject revealed abnormal respiratory actions. Questioning revealed subject had learned to recycle the carbon dioxide inside his body. Repeated attempts to teach the skill to other D-Class personnel failed. Subject terminated. Autopsy reveals no abnormal organ formations. Researcher's Notes Dr. Seriously, how the hell did he do that? Item Number SCP-057 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures Site-57 has been constructed to facilitate SCP-057, as relocation is not feasible. It is highly improbable that any outside knowledge of the artifact exists, based on the circumstances of its discovery and thus, security is of minimal concern. No containment procedures are required, other than the prevention of unauthorized access. All research will be delegated to Dr. Lewis and Dr. Walston unless further specified. Due to the irretrievability of those placed inside SCP-057, access will be granted with the approval of no fewer than two members of O5. Description SCP-057 is a subterranean chamber, with an approximate cylindrical height of 3 meters and diameter of 18 meters. Artifact is comprised of impenetrable slate-colored stone. Inside the chamber are dozens of parallelopiped monoliths, extending from floor to ceiling, that slide in various directions while SCP-057 is active. It was discovered several meters below an undisclosed location, during the construction of a secure containment enclosure for SCP- which was consequently assigned an alternate location at site. An entrance to the chamber is located on the northeast side. When a human enters, the door shuts, and the walls inside the chamber move in such a way as to require the subject's constant attention to maintain a safe course through the artifact. The monoliths slowly open and close, until the subject either surrenders or exhausts themselves, at which time SCP-057 crushes them and reverts to its original inactive state 
after a period of approximately 20 seconds. This process lasts only as long as the subject inside SCP-057 is alive and has proven to take days. Extended testing proposals to gauge the limits of the artifact have been discouraged. All tests on animals, machines, and cadavers have proven futile. Only a living, breathing human being is able to initiate this process upon entering SCP-057. Incident Report 057-1 During the excavation of the artifact, a worker employed by the Foundation for the Unearthing Process entered the chamber without permission at roughly 12.57 a.m. On Upon entering the artifact, the door shut and a dull rumble began to emanate from the chamber. Standard lockdown procedure was initiated, and all personnel in the vicinity were evacuated. A remote-operated vehicle was deployed in order to safely determine the cause of the event and to gauge any possible threat of SCP-057. Aside from the rumbling noises produced during the event, no anomalous effects outside of the artifact were observed. At 4.32 a.m. of the following day, SCP-057 suddenly shut down and returned to its original state as the door shifted back into its open position. At 5.32 a.m., the area was declared safe and the excavation process was completed without further incident. The worker in question was never recovered. Experiment Log 057-1 A controlled experiment for the purpose of exploring the interior of SCP-057 was requested by Drs. Lewis and Walston and approved shortly thereafter by O5 Council. D-1021 was equipped with a radio, able to send and receive transmissions to and from the doctors. Upon entering the chamber, the artifact behaved as expected, with the door abruptly shutting behind D-1021. The following is a transcript of the communication between Dr. Lewis, Dr. Walston, and D-1021. D-1021 Hey, you didn't tell me the door would close. Can you open it again? This place gives me the heebie-jeebies. Dr. Lewis, negative. Please proceed as advised and describe your surroundings. D-1021, okay. Well, there are a bunch of stone columns in here, and they keep rearranging their positions. I... Dr. Walston, D-1021, what is your status? D-1021, damn columns snuck up on me. They're moving around, arranging themselves so they... Dr. Walston, what is it? D-1021. The columns behind me are closing up. The ones ahead of me are spreading out. I don't like this. I can't see the door anymore. Dr. Lewis. Stay calm. Move with the columns and you'll be fine. D-1021. If I stand still, they'll crush me. I have to keep moving or they'll crush me. 17 seconds of silence. How long am I going to be in here? Dr. Walston. It'll be over soon. You're doing fine. Just keep moving. D-1021. What if I'm trapped in here? I... D-1021 begins to hyperventilate. I'm trapped and they're gonna crush me and... Dr. Lewis. D-1... Hey, listen! Get a hold of yourself. The columns will eventually lead you to an exit. Please relax and continue. Subject calms down noticeably. D-1021. So there's... an exit? Thank God. I was scared there for a second that I'd never... Superfluous dialogue expunged. Dr. Walston. Yep, keep it up and you'll be right as rain. You're doing a great job. You'll have no trouble making parole once this is over. The experiment continues without incident for another 41 minutes. At this point, D-1021 becomes noticeably distressed again. D-1021. I saw how big this place is from the outside. Am I going in a circle? Dr. Lewis. Negative. Continue to proceed through the opening columns. You should find the exit. D-1021. There is no f***ing exit. You bastard sons of f trapped me in here and now I'm f***ing trapped. Subject begins to hyperventilate again. Dr. Walston. You are not trapped, D-1021. Continue to the exit or you will be forced to- D-1021. Forced to what? There's nothing you can do to me. I'm gonna f***ing die. I'm gonna die. Dr. Lewis. D-1021. Panicking will only exacerbate your situation. Focus! D-1021 breaks into tears. He continues to cry for the next two hours as he makes his way through the columns and does not reply to any questions. Eventually, the crying ceases. D-1021. So this is it. 
I'm gonna die. I guess I'll just stop and close my eyes. Maybe it won't be so bad. Several minutes of silence. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. D-1021 continues to repeat this for several minutes. Eventually he trails off and falls silent. Dr. Walston. D-1021. D-1021 stops in his tracks, breathing slowly but heavily. Faint sobbing is audible. Dr. Walston. D-1021, proceed through the room as advised. D-1021. I... I... D-1021's gentle sobbing abruptly cuts off. Brief, loud cracking and snapping sounds are heard before the transmission is lost. Strangely, D-1021 did not report any sightings of the remains of the excavation worker lost in Event 057-1. Accordingly, no efforts were made for the recovery of D-1021's remains. As a result of this inconclusive data, reclassification of SCP-057 to Euclid is pending. Item Number SCP-064 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-064 is to be kept in a suitably remote area for observation. Current goals are to generate a geometric model of the object's behavioral pattern and to observe any changes in this pattern due to location and soil composition. Certain sites in the Gobi Desert and Australian Outback, as well as a number of salt flats scattered around the globe, are under consideration for future testing. SCP-064's current location is classified to all personnel under Security Clearance Level 3. Once growth has stopped, field teams are to document the structure's size, shape, and composition, and remove the object for transport to a new site. Description: SCP-064 is a light brown earthenware brick, composed primarily of silicon oxides and some organic matter. The object weighs 1.6 kilograms and measures some 10 centimeters by 6 centimeters by 20 centimeters. Its surface is smooth and flat, with some minor cosmetic chips. By and large, the object is visually similar to most solid bricks used in construction. When left lying on a flat expanse of soft earth, SCP-064 will begin to multiply through an unknown mechanism. Close observation reveals the appearance of an irregular lattice of silicone fibers in the shape of the original object, which then fills and solidifies with a soil-based mixture until it attains the proper mass. This process may be similar to mycelial propagation in fungi, with microscopic root structures mining minerals from soil in the immediate vicinity. Under optimal conditions, soil composition at roughly 90% silicon dioxide, it takes approximately 70 minutes for one complete brick to appear. Given a large expanse of earth to work with, SCP-064 produces a highly complex but theoretically stable freestanding brick structure, including floors and ceilings. Past observations indicate that the structure could attain the shape of a 12-pointed star, over 10 kilometers in diameter and of considerable height. However, this is speculative, as growth stops permanently once the structure contacts a significant obstacle, observed to include any solid object over 10 kilograms in mass. Structural integrity is very high as bricks orient themselves to be as level as possible and fit together almost perfectly. Interestingly, the structure's growth is tailored to a specific set of cardinal directions, with SCP-064 always being the northernmost brick on the lowest level. SCP-064 must be attached for growth to occur. Once SCP-064 is removed, the structure begins to decay and all secondary bricks crumble to dust at a rate roughly equal to their rate of appearance. Replacing the object within 20 minutes halts this decay and allows growth to continue. Past this threshold, the process is irreversible. SCP-064 was found by chance in April of 2000. During satellite observation of an elevated plateau in the Andes Mountains, a camera operator noted that one structure was apparently growing. Extrapolating the object's approximate location from the structure's apparent direction of growth, which stopped during recovery, Field teams located the object by differences in color between SCP-064 and its secondary bricks, which were high in iron oxides from the local soil. A full excavation of the original site is underway in order to ascertain the object's cultural and technological origins. Item Number SCP-083 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures 
SCP-083 is to be kept under constant video surveillance, with at least one Level 3 staff member on call at all times to respond to security breaches. Entrance to SCP-083 is permissible to Level 1 and 2 personnel, with proper clearances, provided they wear a tracking device while inside. Description SCP-083 appears to be an uninhabited two-story row house in a general state of disrepair, with an interior of approximately 366 square meters. The deed and property tax records for the address are missing. The last known persons to reside at the address were the family, but data expunged. Until acquisition by the Foundation, the property was the reputed office for local narcotics dealers, who gained entry to the structure through a front window, since the locking mechanisms on both the front and back doors were corroded and frozen shut. SCP-083 first came to the Foundation's attention when an altercation outside of the building resulted in the front door being kicked in by data expunged. Those who entered through the door of SCP-083, Group A, allegedly found themselves inside a fully furnished and well-maintained home with functioning electricity and a fully stocked kitchen whose appliances and decor appeared to be from the early 20th century. Personnel who entered through the windows, Group B, described the interior as dark and dilapidated, corresponding to the view through the windows. Personnel in Group A also reported that they couldn't see, hear, or find any members of Group B inside the house or of anyone else besides themselves. Group B observed that members of Group A seemed to vanish into thin air upon crossing the door's threshold. Both groups inside the property not only described very different living conditions, but their descriptions didn't even correspond to the same floor plan. Their descriptions matched only in the relative position of the windows, since both groups saw the same street view. Personnel outside the house, however, reported only seeing members of Group B. These observations were repeatedly tested and confirmed by staff, with the additional finding that the rear door of SCP-083 also leads to the furnished interior. Any non-conventional entry, i.e. windows, holes in the roof, down the chimney, etc., leads to the dilapidated interior, and persons inside the different interiors are unable to detect each other's presence, although they both register on standard spectral imaging equipment so long as said equipment is outside SCP-083. It was also discovered that the furnished interior is not static. The floor plan of SCP-083 apparently changes, with a different layout and different numbers and kinds of rooms manifesting. No clear pattern or set interval has been observed in the rearrangement of the interior of SCP-083, but the phenomenon has never been directly observed or experienced by personnel while inside SCP-083. So long as a human presence exists inside, the floor plan seems to remain stable. Although the furnished interior appears to be well maintained, no inhabitants or custodians have ever been detected. Addendum: It has been recommended that SCP-083 be evaluated as a possible autonomous object. Document 083-A 19 walkthroughs of SCP-083 have been conducted to date and each has produced a unique floor plan, with a combined total of 154 different rooms, with 17 of those rooms present on more than one walkthrough, though in differing locations. The rooms conform to a variety of decorative styles, representative of major artistic trends of the late 19th and 20th centuries, complete with era-appropriate furnishings and technology. However, each of the 19 floor plans still equaled 366 square meters of space, and in each walkthrough, the front door has so far consistently led directly to the same Victorian front parlor, designated FP0. The rear door data expunged. Addendum to 083A Upon comparative analysis of all recorded floor plans for SCP-083, it has been observed that the small door in the north wall of FP0 always opens up to reveal a closet, though the dimensions and contents of the closets have varied considerably. A teal and white, deluxe convertible upright Hoover vacuum cleaner has been observed among the contents over 60% of the time. It is unknown why, of the three doors leading from FP0, this one, and the Hoover vacuum within, has shown such a high level of conservation when none of the others have. Document 083C Summary of Experiment 083-03 
On Dr. entered SCP-083 through the front door and set up three digital video cameras. One was placed in the middle of FP-0, a second camera on the second floor, between DR-2 and K-4, and a third camera in the basement room ST-1. Personnel entering through FP-0 window A were unable to confirm the existence of any of the rooms, nor of the three cameras, though the camera's locations inside SCP-083 were externally confirmed with EM sensors. Observation was conducted for a period of 48 hours, during which time no personnel were allowed to enter. No movements within SCP-083 or any of the rooms were observed, and the camera locations remained fixed. After 48 hours, agents were sent in to retrieve the three cameras, but only found one, the camera in FP-0, at its electronically confirmed location. The other two cameras, and the rooms in which they were placed, were gone, with different rooms in their place. Despite this, the EM sensors continued to detect the electrical signatures of the other two cameras, indicating that they had not shifted position at all. Sweeps of SCP-083 were made hourly for the next 36 hours, and although further room arrangements were noted, neither of the rigged rooms reappeared, and after 36 hours, the signals diminished below detection thresholds, possibly due to a loss of battery power in the two missing cameras. Three weeks later, ST-1 recurred on the second floor, and its camera was recovered with a dead battery. The third camera remains missing. Note on number 083C memo. Dr. requested and was granted permission to repeat experiment 083-03, cataloged as experiment 083-05, which resulted in the similar inexplicable loss of six more cameras. While the Foundation is committed to the pursuit of scientific discovery, it has been decided to abandon further experimentation of this type on SCP-083 until a way can be found to do it without overdrafting the department's budget in order to replace disappeared equipment. Dr. Document 083-D On Agent conducted a walkthrough of SCP-083 and reported evidence of food preparation, describing a sound like banging pots and pans and the smell of cooking meat. Said agent was unable to localize the source of the phenomena, nor even to find a kitchen. Said agent did eventually encounter a dining room, designated DR-8, but it was clearly in a state of non-use. Agent estimated the sounds and smell persisted for approximately 20 minutes, before fading away. There were no other signs of intruders. Document 083-E On smoke was observed emanating from SCP-083's chimney. A Foundation agent was dispatched to investigate, and found the location designated SR-12 with burning embers in the fireplace. SR-12 had been previously documented on SCP-083 Internal Surveys 5 and 6, but in both prior encounters the fireplace was cold and swept clean. Said agent recovered a partially burned fragment of newsprint from the fireplace, data expunged, as well as the nub of a cigar. A sweep of SCP-083 found no other evidence of intruders, and a review of video surveillance confirmed no one else entering or leaving the house, aside from appropriate personnel at expected intervals. Agent remained on site until the fire was out, at which point smoke emanation ceased and did not recur. Said agent made no alterations to SR-12 and left the premises at 24 hours later, said agent returned to SCP-083 but SR-12 was no longer present, and has not been found on three subsequent walkthroughs. Analysis of the cigar did not produce any DNA, but did yield data expunged. Addendum Recommended SCP-083 be evaluated for upgrade to Euclid status. Approved. Item Number SCP-087 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-087 is located on the campus of The doorway leading to SCP-087 is constructed of reinforced steel with an electro-release lock mechanism. It has been disguised to resemble a janitorial closet consistent with the design of the building. The lock mechanism on the doorknob will not release unless volts are applied in conjunction with counterclockwise rotation of the key. The inside of the door is lined with 6 centimeters of industrial foam padding. Due to the results of the final exploration, no personnel are permitted access to SCP-087. Description 
SCP-087 is an unlit platform staircase. Stairs descend on a 38 degree angle for 13 steps before reaching a semicircular platform of approximately 3 meters in diameter. Descent direction rotates 180 degrees at each platform. The design of SCP-087 limits subjects to a visual range of approximately 1.5 flights. A light source is required for any subjects exploring SCP-087, as there are no lighting fixtures or windows present. Lighting sources brighter than 75 watts have shown to be ineffective, as SCP-087 seems to absorb excess light. Subjects report and audio recordings confirm the distressed vocalizations from what is presumed to be a child between the ages of and the source of the distress calls is estimated to be located approximately 200 meters below the initial platform. However, any attempts to descend the staircase have failed to bring subjects closer to the source. The depth of descent calculated from Exploration 4, the longest exploration, is shown to be far beyond both the possible structure of both the building and geological surroundings. At this time, it is unknown if SCP-087 has an endpoint. SCP-087 has undergone four video recorded explorations by Class D personnel. Each subject conducting an exploration has encountered SCP-087-1, which appears as a face with no visible pupils, nostrils, or mouth. The nature of SCP-087-1 is entirely unclear, but it has been determined that it is not the source of the pleading. Subjects exhibit feelings of intense paranoia and fear when faced with SCP-087-1, but it is undetermined whether said feelings are abnormal or simply natural reactions. Addendum Over a period of two weeks following Exploration 4, several members of the staff and students from the campus reported knocking at a variable rate of one to two seconds per knock, coming from the interior of SCP-087. The door leading to SCP-087 has been fitted with 6 centimeter thick industrial padding. All reports of knocking have ceased. Authorized personnel may refer to documents 0871 through 0874 for transcripts of explorations 1 through 4. Document 0871, Exploration 1. D-8432 is a 43-year-old Caucasian male of average build and appearance and unremarkable psychological background. Class D designation is a result of demotion due to mishandling SCP. D-8432 is equipped with a 75-watt flood lamp with battery power capable of lasting 24 hours, a handheld camcorder fitted with a transmission stream, and an audio headset for communication with Dr. at control. D-8432 steps through the doorway onto the initial platform. Despite the wattage, the flood lamp only illuminates the first nine steps. The second platform is not visible. D-8432, it's f dark. Doctor, is your flood lamp functioning properly? D-8432 shines the light out the door and into the academic building's hallway. The light reaches significantly further. D-8432, yeah, it's working. It just won't light these stairs all the way down. Doctor, thank you. Please continue. D-8432 descends for 13 steps before reaching the second platform. The platform is in the shape of a semicircle, with an apparently concrete surface and walls. There are no distinct markings, aside from nondescript patches of dust, dirt, or wear, consistent with that which is found in a typical concrete stairwell. D-8432 rotates 180 degrees to begin descent down the second flight, then pauses. Doctor. Reason for stopping? D-8432. You hear that? There's a f***ing kid down there. Sounds like one. None of the described audio is feeding through the camera or mic at this time. Doctor, could you please describe the sound? D-8432. It's young. Either female or a very young boy. It's crying and sobbing and saying, Please. Help. Please. Yeah, it keeps repeating that and crying. Doctor, can you estimate its distance from your current location? D-8432. Ah, uh, fuck, I don't know. Maybe 200 meters down? Doctor, please continue down the next flight. The subject descends another 13 steps. As he reaches the landing, 
Audio of the child as described is picked up. The child alternates between sobbing, wailing, and the words please, help, and down here. The level of audio is consistent with D8432's report of it being approximately 200 meters below. Doctor, can you still hear the crying? D8432, yeah. Doctor, we're picking it up as well. Please continue down. Stop if you notice any changes in the audio or environment. The subject ascends another three flights of stairs before stopping. D8432, keep going? Doctor, please. D8432 continues another 17 flights, total of 22 flights, before stopping. There are no visual changes in the environment, and each flight has been a consistent 13 steps. D8432, I'm not getting any f closer to the kid. Stereo audio confirms that the crying noise has not increased in volume and remains approximately 200 meters below the subject. Doctor, noted, please continue. The subject continues another 28 flights before stopping, 50 flights total. D8432 is standing on the 51st landing, counting the initial ground level landing. D8432 is estimated to be 200 meters below the initial platform. 34 minutes have elapsed. The volume of the crying has not increased. D8432, I feel a little uneasy. Doctor. You spent a long time in a dark, unknown stairwell. It's natural. Please continue. The subject hesitates before stepping down on the next stair. As the subject moves forward, the flood lamp illuminates a face, located approximately at the bottom of the flight, SCP-0871. It appears to be the same size and shape as a human head, except it is lacking a mouth, nostrils, and pupils. The face is completely motionless but is making direct eye contact, indicating its awareness of D8432. D8432, yelling. F what the f is that? Doctor, can you please describe what you see? D8432, it's some sort of f person face thing and it's f looking right at me. Doctor, is it moving? D8432, pause heavy breathing. No, it's just staring at me. Fuck, it's creepy. Doctor, please approach and further illuminate the entity. D8432. Fuck, I don't want to. F the face jerks forward about 50 centimeters directly toward D8432. D8432, yelling. Fuck. D8432 enters a panicked state and rapidly ascends SCP 087. D8432 reaches the ground floor in 18 minutes, at which time he collapses and passes out. There is no sign of SCP-087-1. Review of the footage indicates an equal number of flights and steps ascending as descending. Audio of the crying and pleading remains at the same volume until the last flight, at which point it ceases. Medical reports indicate collapse was a result of the rapid ascension of the stairs, causing fatigue. Document 087-2 Exploration 2 D9035 is a 28-year-old African-American male of strong build. Psychological background indicates no abnormalities, except an extreme hatred for women. Subject has an extensive record of data expunged. D9035 is equipped with a 100-watt flood lamp with battery power, capable of lasting 24 hours, a handheld camcorder fitted with a transmission stream, and an audio headset for communication with Dr. That control. D9035 is also equipped with a backpack containing 100 small LED lights with adhesive backs and battery lives of approximately three weeks. Lights turn on and off by compressing them. D9035 shines the flood lamp down the first flight of stairs. Despite the extra wattage, the light does not illuminate beyond the ninth step. D9035, you want me to go down there, Doc? Doctor, Please shine your flood lamp outside of SCP-087 to verify it is functioning properly. D-9035 shines the light into the hallway. Comparison with the footage from Exploration 1 confirms it is indeed brighter. Doctor, thank you. Please continue to the first landing. D-9035 Hey Doc, I know what you said and all, but I don't think I want to go there. Doctor, please continue to the first landing. 
D9035. Doc, look, I... Doctor, interrupting. As per our earlier conversation, please continue to the first landing. D9035 pauses for 18 seconds, then descends 13 steps to the first landing, and stops. D9035, is that a kid? Doctor, please remove one of the adhesive lights and affix it to the wall on the landing. D9035, Doc, you hear that? Is that a kid down there? Doctor, that's unconfirmed. Please affix an adhesive light to the wall and verify it functions. D9035 hesitates, then removes one of the lights from his backpack and adheres it to the wall. He presses on the light and it turns on. Doctor, please turn off your flood lamp. D9035 hesitates again before turning off the lamp. The LED light illuminates the landing, but does not extend beyond the first step either way. Doctor, thank you. You may turn your flood lamp back on. Please continue to descend. At each landing, affix an LED light to the wall and turn it on. If you notice anything unusual, please report it. D9035 turns the flood lamp back on, then descends the next flight of stairs. As he sets foot on the landing, the audio picks up sounds of pleading and crying, consistent with those of the first exploration. Doctor, can you still hear the previously reported audio? D9035, uh, yeah. She sounds about 150, maybe 200 meters down. Am I supposed to get her? Look, Doc, I don't do good with kids. Doctor, please place the light and continue down until you notice anything unusual. The subject adheres the light to the wall and turns it on, then continues to the next landing. He adheres the third LED light to the wall and turns it on. D9035 continues in this manner for the next 25 flights before stopping. D9035, I don't think I'm getting any closer to the kid, Doc. Doctor, how far below would you estimate the source of the sound to be? D9035, same as before, 150 to 200 meters down. Doctor, thank you. Please proceed. D9035 continues in the same fashion for the next 24 flights. At the 51st landing, he stops. Footage shows an arced gouge in the concrete wall, estimated to be approximately 50 centimeters long and 10 centimeters wide. The first step down from the landing appears to be completely smashed into rubble. D9035, you see that? Doctor, yes. Can you please describe what you see? D9035, looks like something slashed at the wall, and the step over here is all crumbled up and stuff. The slash mark looks really smooth. D9035 touches the gouge mark. D9035, yeah, it's smooth. Feels like glass. Doctor, thank you. Please continue down. D9035, look doc. I think I've gone far enough. Doctor, please continue, as per our agreement. D9035, I don't want to be doing this, agreement or not. Data expunged. D9035 steps over the destroyed step and continues down the staircase. Nothing is notable at the next landing. D9035 adheres an LED light to the wall and continues in the same fashion for another 38 flights. The sound of the crying and pleading still has not gotten closer. D9035 is on the 89th landing, and 74 minutes have elapsed from the beginning of the exploration. Subject is estimated to be 350 meters below the initial platform. D9035 I feel like the kid's just trying to lure me down here, Doc. I think it's time for me to- D9035 stops talking and moving, as the flood lamp illuminates SCP-0871. The face is staring directly at D9035, again indicating awareness of the subject's presence. Although SCP-0871 appears to be unmoving, its location is 38 flights below the initial counter in Exploration 1, indicating it is mobile. Doctor, is there a reason you stopped? D9035, unresponsive. D9035's breathing grows labored. SCP-0871 remains immobile for an additional 13 seconds. SCP-0871 blinks. D-9035, yelling, incomprehensible. 
SCP-087-1 jerks forward until it is approximately 90 centimeters from D-9035. Subject turns and flees up the stairs. Doctor, please relax and calm down. Turn around. We need a closer look at the face. D-9035 ignores Doctor and continues rapid ascent. He continues to scream incomprehensibly. Doctor, D-9035, can you hear me? Please slow down. D-9035 is unresponsive and continues rapidly climbing the stairs. His screaming diminishes to babbling. After ascending 72 flights, D-9035 collapses on the 17th landing. Doctor, D-9035, can you hear me? D-9035 is unresponsive, but labored breathing can be heard through the audio feed. For the next 14 minutes, D-9035 is immobile. The visual feed is black, and the audio picks up only the subject's breathing and the continuous pleading coming from below. After 14 minutes and 32 seconds of unchanging visual and audio feeds, the sound of a rapid heartbeat not consistent with a human heartbeat and a low cracking noise is heard. Seven seconds later, D-9035 gasps and revives, continuing his ascent of the stairs rapidly and wordlessly. The heartbeat and cracking cease, and nothing abnormal is detected on the visual feed. He remains unresponsive. D-9035 exits SCP-087 and sits on the floor outside of the entrance. D-9035 then enters a catatonic state from which he has not yet recovered. Document 087-3 Exploration 3. D-9884 is a 23-year-old female of average build and appearance. Psychological background indicates a history of depression. Subject has a minimal record of using excessive force to data expunged. D-9884 is equipped with a 75-watt flood lamp with battery power, capable of lasting 24 hours, a handheld camcorder fitted with a transmission stream, and an audio headset for communication with Dr. that control. D-9884 is also equipped with a backpack containing 3.75 liters of water, 15 nutrient bars, and one thermal blanket. D-9884 stands on the ground level landing of SCP-087. The flood lamp illuminates only the first nine steps. LED lights placed on the wall during the last exploration are not visible. Doctor, please descend the first flight and examine the landing wall. D-9884 descends 13 steps and stops at the landing. There is no trace of the LED light at the location footage from Exploration 2 indicates it was placed. D-9884, yeah, um, it's just a dirty concrete wall. There's like nothing on it. No, wait, it's a little bit sticky right here. D-9884 indicates the spot on the wall the LED light should have been located. D-9884. There's a child crying down there. She's... she's begging for help and crying. Doctor, thank you. Please continue down the steps until you notice anything unusual. D-9884 descends. Upon reaching the next landing, audio of the crying child consistent with the prior two explorations is picked up. No LED lights appear to be present on any of the landing walls. D-9884 continues with no incident until she reaches the 17th landing. D-9884. Ew, there's something on the ground here, and it smells really bad. It's all sticky and stuck on my shoe. Ugh, it's so gross. Video feed confirms presence of substance occupying a space approximately 50 centimeters in diameter. Doctor, can you describe the scent? D-9884. Uh, it kinda smells like old rusty metal and pee. Doctor, thank you. Please continue until you notice anything else. D-9884 continues to the 51st landing without incident. The 51st landing remains unchanged from the previous expedition, and similar observations are made. D-9884 is asked again to descend until anything unusual is noticed. Subject continues her descent until the 89th landing is reached. The video feed jerks and the subject yells. D-9884. Ah, f There's a hole in the ground, and I almost fell in. Video feed confirms the presence of a hole, approximately one meter in diameter. The subject shines the floodlight down, revealing only blackness. Approximately four seconds pass, and a light of an indeterminate distance down the hole flicks on for approximately two seconds, and then back off. 
D9884. There was a light down there. It's gone now, but it was on for like a second. Did you see it? Doctor. Yes. Can you estimate the depth of this hole? D9884. No way. It's too deep. At least a kilometer. Like, way more than a kilometer. Doctor. Thank you. Can you still hear the sounds of the child? D9884. Uh-huh. She still sounds far away. I don't feel like I'm getting any closer. It's like for every step I take, she takes one down. Doctor, please continue down until you encounter anything unusual. D9884 continues to descend SCP-087 for approximately an hour, covering an additional 164 flights. She stops to rest on the 253rd landing, consuming one nutrient bar and several gulps of water. D9884 is at an estimated 1.1 kilometers below the initial landing, yet the sound of the child has not changed in volume. After pausing for four minutes, D9884 resumes her descent, making no stops for another 216 flights, 1.5 hours later. D9884 is on the 469th landing, an approximate 1.8 kilometers below the ground level. D9884, I'm not getting anywhere. I think it's time I went back. I mean, going down is one thing, but this is a long climb back. Doctor, you have been provided with food, water, and blankets to last you 24 hours. Please continue down. D9884. No, I think I'm going to go back up. D9884 turns towards the previous flight of stairs. D9884. I. Screams. SCP-0871. The face is directly behind 9884, blocking her ascent. The face appears approximately 30 centimeters from the lens of the camera. Its eyes are fixed directly on the lens, this time looking not at the subject, but the person viewing the video feed. The video feed glitches and freezes for four seconds, accompanied by a static-like screeching noise from the audio feed. It then cuts to bumpy visuals of D9884 descending the stairs rapidly. D9884 panicked and hysterical. It's been following me. This whole time it's been right behind me. Oh god, it's right behind me. It was looking right at me. Doctor, please do something. Please, please help me. Oh god, no, please get it away. Please, no, please. I knew it was following me. Help make it leave. Please, no. It was looking at me. It was staring at me. It knew I was here. It's been watching me this whole time. Oh god, please help me. No, please. This continues in a similar fashion until the end. D9884 continues to scream and plead hysterically as she rapidly descends the staircase. The previously heard static-like screeching seems to overlay the audio feed, beneath which can still be heard the original sound of the crying child. Approximately 14 flights down, the video feed swings to show the area directly behind D9884. The face is now approximately 20 centimeters from the camera lens. It is not staring at the subject, rather it is fixated on the camera lens giving the illusion it is making eye contact with those viewing the footage. It is important to note that since the sighting of SCP-087-1, the sound of the crying girl and pleading has been increasing in volume, indicating D-984 is nearing the source. After an approximate 150 panicked flights of descent, with three visual confirmations of SCP-087-1 still in pursuit, D-984 trips and appears to fall unconscious. Audio feed indicates strong proximity to the source of the crying. The static and screeching noise continue. Video feed shows yet another descending flight of stairs, indicating D9884 still has not reached the base of the stairwell. Twelve seconds of motionlessness pass before the face comes in full view of the camera, eye contact being made directly with the viewer. Audio and video feeds cut out, and no connection is re-established. Item number. SCP-102 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-102 is currently in the possession of Marshall, Carter, and Dark LTD. Because ownership appears to be a binding, deed-based legalistic agreement independent of eminent domain, SCP-102 cannot be transferred to Foundation control in the foreseeable future. Description SCP-102 is a pair of standalone condominium-style beach houses, located at currently owned by Marshall, Carter, and Dark LTD through the use of a dummy corporation known as Geyser Housing Associates, and rented to MC&D members as a 
vacation home for those with discerning taste in the eclectic adventures of privileged life. The two share similar properties, although data expunged. SCP-102-1 is the house on the left, number When a person whose name is not on the lease for SCP-102-1 enters the building, its interior appears as that of a crumbling empty house, with the prone body of the current leaseholder just inside the doorway if the house is occupied. Forensics tests on materials recovered from within the house show it to have been abandoned since the mid to late 70s. All photographs taken within SCP-102-1 corroborate this, regardless of the lease status of the photographer. However, when the leaseholder of the house enters via the front door, they find themselves in a fairly normal and well-kept condominium, decorated with a nautical theme. Often, they report a sensation of dizziness upon entering, which fades within a few seconds. When the leaseholder of SCP-102-1 exits the building, they become what is to all intents and purposes an incorporeal spiritual manifestation, capable of willful invisibility and moving through solid objects unimpeded. They enter and remain in this state each time they leave the house for the duration of the lease. At the conclusion of their lease, or at any time they willfully break the terms of said lease, they fall briefly unconscious and awaken on the floor at the front entrance of SCP-102-1 which appears to them as it does to any non-leaseholder. No bodies have been observed being removed from the house prematurely. SCP-102-2 is the house on the right, number At first glance, the effect of SCP-102-2 is identical to SCP-102-1. However, data expunged advanced decay, followed by data expunged. Leaseholders of SCP-102-2 who do not exit the building promptly at the cessation of their contract are to be declared missing, presumed dead, 30 days following the end of their lease. Leaseholders who do exit the building are to be administered a regimen of steroid-based enhancers to counter the data expunged deterred constantly for signs of psychological aberration. Addendum All information in this report is unverified, though details are consistent from multiple sources. The content of this report was taken from interviews with D-Class personnel numbers 1070869, Death Sentence, Rape, Murder, 1033654, -3 Life Without Parole, Aggravated Sexual Assault on a Minor, and 3370633, Death Sentence, all of whom were frequent tenants of SCP-1021 prior to incarceration. It is theorized that D-1033654 made use of SCP-1021's effect to commit data expunged. Item Number SCP-130 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-130 is to be staffed by 12 D-Class, 6 Security Agents, Level 2-130, and 1 Researcher, Level 3-130, twice per day starting at one half hour before local sunrise and sunset. All staff are to be appropriately uniformed. When not staffed, two security agents will remain in the lobby, and two additional agents will patrol within the building. Agents are advised not to prevent people from entering the lobby, but to notify MTF Alpha 4, Pony Express, to intercept anyone who receives mail or a package. Twice per day, bundles, SCP-132, will appear in the mail room. The parcels within the bundles are to be sorted by uniformed staff into appropriate bags and placed in a designated vehicle for transport to site. Should mail arrive with the following addresses, follow Procedure Franklin 16, detailed in Addendum 132. Otherwise, mail will be checked under standard practices for any items of interest. Objects are not to be placed for outgoing mail unless certified orders are given by O5. Procedure Franklin 17 outlines the protocol used in these cases. Should anyone else enter SCP-130 to use the outgoing mail slot, they are to be permitted to do so, then intercepted by MTF Alpha 4 as soon as possible for questioning. The incident is to be reviewed through security tapes, and the outgoing mail watched for subsequent bundles and checked through the list of previous parcels received. Description. SCP-130 is a post office in an undisclosed location in South Africa, constructed in 18... SCP-130 had been closed and left abandoned for a number of years. The building is in excellent condition for its age, and maintains itself without human intervention, including moderate structural repairs. SCP-130 has been designated a historic site through an agreement with the South African government. 
Five times per week at local sunrise and sunset, several bags and boxes will appear in the mailroom. The bundles, designated SCP-132, will show only on weekdays, with the exception of current postal holidays. Bundles are to be handled as per special containment procedures as above. Inside of the lobby, along with the post office boxes, is a slot labeled for outgoing mail. The slot is able to accept packages up to 40 centimeters wide and 6 centimeters high, with no apparent limit for length. Once inserted into the slot, packages disappear and will eventually turn up in the outgoing mail bundles, if they have not done so previously. Addendum 131 SCP-130 came to the attention of the Foundation in 19 when packages and letters began to be circulated bearing the postmark for the site. The parcels appeared in post offices throughout the world, with correct postage for delivery either locally or internationally, depending on the parcel. The parcels were often undeliverable, either to non-existent addresses or to recipients who were not at the address, and so ended up in dead letter offices. Various Foundation assets noted the odd postmark, and Mobile Task Force Alpha 4 mobilized to investigate. MTF Alpha 4 arrived in where they discovered the town had mostly been abandoned decades ago. The post office appeared to be in excellent condition, not only well maintained, but clean. While MTF Alpha 4 searched, bundles of mail appeared in the mailroom. Agents searched the bundles and discovered a variety of letters, parcels, and packages, all with that day's date and the postmark for that post office. A Foundation agent attempted to open one of the parcels, which resulted in the agent vanishing from sight. Six days later, a package appeared in Sight's mailroom. Inside of it was said agent, and an envelope with a receipt for postage due. The agent had returned to sender and postage due tattooed on their back and was in a comatose state. Agent remained in that state until the envelope was delivered to SCP-130's outgoing mail slot, whereupon the agent returned to consciousness with no recollection from the time of disappearance. Similar results also occurred when agents tried to take away or damage either the parcels or the post office itself. Further investigation led to the current containment procedures, where D-Class personnel sort through the mail when it appears. Once processed and put in a marked vehicle, the mail can then leave the area unmolested. If the bundles are untouched, however, the bundles will vanish and later appear in the postal systems of the world in order to be delivered. Addendum 132 Through examination of the mail parcels over the past several years, research has shown certain trends. Over percent of the mail is of a mundane nature, except for the matter of the postmark. Exceptions to this are letters that were apparently unsent, for whatever reason, and temporally displaced letters. The former, while odd, will be destroyed in order to protect the nature of SCP-130. Letters addressed to Foundation sites or personnel are to be sent to site where they will be reviewed. Procedure Franklin 16 When mail is specifically addressed to the mail is to be sealed in a case with active countermeasures and brought to the office of the present level 5-130 supervisor. Mail will then be screened for possible explosive, chemical, biological, mimetic, or any and all threats. After screening, the mail will be opened and assessed. While no new artifacts requiring secure containment have arrived, the possibility cannot be ignored. Mail either addressed to or intercepted by the office is often temporally sensitive, and as such, impact must be minimized to limit changes. The possibility of the information being used to alter present-day events detrimentally must also be weighed. Using the information given by SCP-130 to alter events requires a two-thirds supermajority vote by the overseers. Examples of intercepted messages are stored within Document 131. Mail with the following code phrase are to be immediately delivered after screening, without being read by 5-130. After so doing, that code phrase is to be invalidated, and the next one brought in line. Procedure Franklin 17 All outgoing mail is to be sent with appropriate current postage at the time of sending, and must be marked with a suitable code phrase. The mail sent by this method is to be logged, then cross-checked with past parcels to ensure temporal integrity. Upon attempt at mailing, should a receipt appear for postage due, the amount shall be placed in an envelope and put in the outgoing mail slot. 
The slot will accept the following currencies. Rands, Euros, and The use of counterfeit currencies will result in a lethal reaction by SCP-130, and an additional fine will be levied until mail can be sent again. Addendum 133 Incident 136 On A package arrived, with the address for a post office box at the site. Dr. The researcher assigned to SCP-130 placed the parcel into the POB and waited. Several minutes later, an unknown person walked into the lobby. The subject appeared to be briefly puzzled and walked over to the box. The locked box opened at his touch, and he expressed surprise at seeing the parcel with his name on it. MTF Alpha 4, being on site, was dispatched to investigate once the subject was out of sight of SCP-130 and subsequently interviewed. The subject had no plans to visit that day, but had felt an unexplained desire to go there while driving nearby to visit family in the area. Upon opening the package, data expunged. A Class A amnestic was administered to the subject and was released after memory insertion. Document 131 Executive Summary of Instances SCP-132 To this date, there have been several instances of SCP-132 that fall under Procedure Franklin-16, and with certain exceptions, all have been reviewed by this office. Below are brief summaries of sampled parcels addressed to persons of note, both within and outside of the Foundation. Dr. M. E. 5-130 Addressee Dr. Alto Clef Summary To this date, Dr. Clef has had several parcels addressed to him in a variety of fashions, up to using valid code phrases per Procedure Franklin 16. In each and every case, these parcels have contained a wide variety of means to assassinate the good doctor, tied with either gloating, terse judgments, or even apologies. Notes After many deaths and dollars worth of damage to Foundation material, all missives addressed to Dr. Clef are to be thoroughly scanned and opened by remote under Hazmat 3 conditions. Due to the incident on only D-Class personnel should handle the mail and be within 50 meters until disposed of. Addressee, Dr. Agatha Wrights. Summary, Dr. Wrights has had a variety of greeting cards sent to her, denoting such things as birthdays, anniversaries, and holidays such as Mother's Day from undisclosed recipients. Notes, due to all such parcels are to be incinerated and under no circumstances are they to be mentioned to Dr. Wrights. Addressee, Dr. King. Summary. Each Arbor Day for the past several years, a variety of Apple-based products have been mailed to Dr. King, including seeds, cider, and brandy. Every September 26th, a biography of John Chapman, aka Johnny Appleseed, has appeared. Notes. Christ, what did this guy do to SCP-130? I don't even think he's been to South Africa. 5-130 Item Number SCP-167 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-167 is currently kept in room of Research Command 06. Its door is to be padlocked at all times when not under study. Anyone wishing to obtain the key to conduct unscheduled exploration of, or to study SCP-167, may do so only with the permission of the relevant Level 3 personnel assigned to this SCP. Description SCP-167 is a cube, measuring approximately 10 meters on its edge, created from an unidentified shiny white plastic polymer. Affixed to one of the faces of the cube is a large metal door. It is unknown if this door is part of the original SCP, or if it was affixed by someone else before the object was acquired by the SCP Foundation. The interior dimensions of this cube are identical to the exterior, minus several centimeters for the width of the cube, except that two of the remaining three walls each have doorways in them. These doorways lead directly to identical rooms, each with two more doorways leading to more identical rooms. This pattern continues for as far as the research teams have been able to determine. The placement of these doorways appears to be random. No pattern has been found that explains which two of the three remaining walls have doors. SCP-167 shows signs of being explored before. 
A number of rooms, especially those at a low depth, have red dots or other markers painted next to the doorway back to the entrance. Researchers have recently taken to replicate this behavior on any rooms they visit, after the events mentioned in document number 167-08. Additionally, several man-made and natural objects have been found scattered in some of the rooms of SCP-167. Religious idols, circa 500 BCE. Several treasure chests, circa 1500 CE. Data expunged. And several SCPs, most notably. Data expunged. Addendum 167-01. SCP-167 does not appear to follow the rules of Euclidean geometry. A different path to rooms which should be the same room was taken by two researchers. Both arrived at their destination, but neither saw nor heard the other. How SCP-167 is warping space to create this effect is unknown, but warrants further study. Addendum 167-02 A request to test the effects of SCP-184 on SCP-167 has been suggested. This experiment is under consideration. Addendum 167-03 a request to use SCP-167 as a compact storage space for benign SCPs has been proposed by Dr. This proposal requires a reclassification of SCP-167 to safe class, so a re-evaluation is pending. Document 167-08 As most of you are aware, Dr. was videotaped entering SCP-167 several days ago without the requisite ball of twine and he has not yet returned. His ultimate fate is unknown, but the search teams have turned up nothing. Let this be a reminder to all of you just how easy it could be to get lost in there if you don't utilize some method of marking your path. If I find that any other researcher has disobeyed the safety regulations and entered without a ball of twine, no matter how far or deep they intend to go, they will find themselves being transferred to another facility for researching Keter-class SCPs, where they should have ample motivation to learn to follow safety regulations quite quickly. Dr. Klein Item Number SCP-176 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-176 is contained on-site under the cover of industrial chemical contamination. Any civilians attempting to enter SCP-176 must be detained. Multiple high-speed cameras are set up within the observation room and linked to continuously running analysis computers. If any deviation is observed in the recorded sequence, all recorded data must be immediately backed up and senior staff notified. Description: SCP-176 is an abandoned chemical factory situated near Data Expunged. The building consists of a factory floor and an observation room on the second floor, separated from the main room by one-way mirrors. There are three entrances to the building. A three-bay loading dock, whose doors have been welded shut. A ground floor employee entrance. A second floor observation room entrance, accessible via a metal staircase on the north end of the building. When the main building is entered via the loading dock or employee entrance, no anomalies are observed, merely an empty room in severe disuse and disrepair, with a small amount of metallic debris consistent with a stripped-down, abandoned factory. The inside staircase leading up to the observation room is missing and inaccessible, and so far, every attempt to enter the observation room via the inside of the factory through the access door or windows has failed. When the observation room is entered via the second floor outside door, a factory observation room consistent in disuse and disrepair to the rest of the building is found. However, when the factory floor is viewed through the observation room windows, the anomalous property of SCP-176 is visible. The view from the observation room window shows a static repeating scene that lasts approximately 11.3 seconds before repeating. Visible through the window is a room of the same dimensions and layout as the factory floor but painted white and sterilized. Set up in the middle of the room is a huge electronic device of indeterminate function, covering at least 50 square meters and extending approximately 2 meters in height at its highest point. Five individuals in white clean suits appear to be working on the device. 
Approximately 5.9 seconds into the scene, the employee entrance door bursts open, and four individuals, wearing black tactical armor with no identifying marks or emblems, enter the room and open fire on the research personnel. At 11.3 seconds, the device in the center of the room emits an intense flash of light and radiation, and the scene resets. Analysis of thousands of instances of the scene has shown no variation in the sequence. So far, all attempts at interacting with the scene have failed. Any attempts to breach the window or door from within the observation room are met with resistance, inconsistent with the suggested strength of the materials comprising their frames. To date, all attempts that have resulted in successful penetration of the door or window have resulted in the damage being instantly reverted, along with the sequence during the burst of light. Any tools or limbs extended outside of the observation room are cleanly severed and have never been found. Research is ongoing into the nature of the device at the center of SCP-176, as well as the identities of the individuals involved. Addendum 176-1 Further Analysis of Individuals in SCP-176 Analysis has yielded the following information regarding the individuals visible in the scene. Unidentified Researcher Number 1 Male Caucasian, approximately 40 years of age, with brown hair and green eyes. Stands in the southeast corner of the room, reading from a standing monitor. Hit three times in the chest by automatic fire at approximately 8.1 seconds and appears to be killed instantly. Unidentified researcher number two. Male, Asian, approximately 35 years of age, with black hair and brown eyes. Stands to the left of researcher number one, carries a clipboard with indecipherable writing on a notepad. Hit once in right shoulder at eight seconds, before dropping to the floor, out of sight behind the device. Unidentified researcher number three. Female Caucasian, approximately 40 years of age, with brown hair and amber eyes. Sits at a desk in the southwest corner of the room, working at a computer station. Is out of the line of sight when the gunfire begins and takes cover under the desk. Appears to be reaching for a weapon of some sort shortly before the end of the sequence. Unidentified researcher number four. Male, Caucasian, approximately 45 years of age, with brown hair and indeterminate eyes. Stands in front of the device to the northeast, with his back to the observation room. Shot twice in the head at 7.2 seconds. Killed instantly. Unidentified researcher number five. Male, indeterminate. Stands in the northwest corner, mostly obscured. Presumably shot at approximately 7.8 seconds and drops down, out of sight. Unidentified assailant number one. Male, indeterminate wielding a suppressed M4A1. Enters first, shoots researcher number four and researcher number five, then moves toward the device. Unidentified assailant number two. Male, indeterminate, wielding a suppressed MP5N. Enters second, turns left and shoots researcher number one and researcher number two, then sweeps toward the southeast. Unidentified assailant number three. Male, indeterminate, wielding a suppressed MP5N. Enters third, turns right and moves under the observation room. Unidentified assailant number four. Male, indeterminate, wielding a suppressed TMP. Stays at the door, covering the others. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.